All right, well, it's very good to be back with you this evening, and I'm going to talk about dinosaurs, and that there's a number of reasons why this is a good topic for Christians to know something about. Uh, for one, evolutionists who reject the biblical account of creation and instead believe that all life is descended from a common ancestor, they like to use dinosaurs almost as an icon of evolution. And so whenever you see dinosaurs talked about, it's almost always from an evolutionary perspective. And they, they almost use it as a substitution for an argument. It's like, you know, why bother, you know, you're a creationist? Well, what about dinosaurs? They're checkmate, right? Don't even have to make an argument for it. Because in all the movies, it's pre presented that dinosaurs evolved from a Thecodon ancestor over hundreds of millions of years. They died out 65 million years ago, long before humans had evolved. And so that we never saw them unless, of course, you resurrect them in Jurassic Park and things like that. But um, no, they're presented from an evolutionary perspective and just about all the media and movies, television, even in the most books that are, that are done, textbooks even present them from a secular perspective. And so it's good for us to know what the Bible has to say about this topic because the Bible does have something to say about dinosaurs. And this, secondly, this is kind of an, an example of how we need to think about everything, really everything we need to think about from a biblical perspective. And our, our society tries to tr train us to think in a secular sense, and it takes a while to get, to get rid of that and to really think scripturally about all things. And then third, dinosaurs are just really cool. So that's a good reason to study them as well. So let's dive right in. It's always helpful to define our terms at the beginning. So what are dinosaurs? You probably know they're reptiles, so they're scaly creatures, but, and, and they're land animals. Now we'll talk about other things too. We'll talk about flying reptiles, because those are cool. And we'll talk about swimming marine reptiles as well, like plesiosaurs. But technically those are not dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are land animals by definition, but they are different from modern land animals in a couple of ways. First of all, they tended to have large uh, holes in their skull, <coughs> probably to reduce weight, perhaps in some of the larger ones. But the main characteristic that makes dinosaurs different from any modern land reptile is the structure of their legs. Dinosaurs, modern reptiles have their legs out to the side in a sprawling position. Think of a crocodile or an alligator, something like that. Dinosaurs had their legs underneath their body, kind of like ours. And so that makes them uh, different from any of the uh, modern reptiles that we have today. <laughs> so it, there, my point in saying that is sometimes people will ask, is a dinosaur like an alligator that just got big? But no, their structure is different. And so they are a different kind of animal. There's several different kinds of dinosaurs that we'll talk about. When we look at any perspective, when we look at any topic, we look at it from the perspective that God's word is true or the perspective that it isn't. And the most common uh, view, the most common religion, really, besides Christianity, at least in terms of its success in this nation, is secular humanism. That's the big one. And that is based on an evolutionary worldview, where we all just evolved from the slime, and there's no God that we have to answer to, and so we can make our own rules. And that's why you're seeing a lot of the perversion that we're seeing, in, in, at, least, at least in this nation. Uh, they've made great inroads. Secular humanism is based on an evolutionary worldview. And my secular colleagues, when they look at dinosaurs, they already have that view in their mind. Make no mistake. A lot of times people think that scientists, even scientists think this, that they come to the evidence neutrally with no preconceptions or biases. Well, that's absurd and it's impossible because if you're a thinking human being, you have some biases, you have some thoughts about things. It's just a question of whether or not you have correct thoughts about things, that's the issue. So secular humanists, when they're looking at dinosaur fossils, they're already thinking, this isn't something that was created by God, this is something that evolved over millions of years, and it, you know, they died out millions of years ago, maybe an asteroid wiped them out, or what have you. And they already have that view in their mind, and then that causes them to interpret the evidence the way that they do. Whereas, I start with the Bible when I look at dinosaurs, and I wanna encourage you to do that, because if you wanna get the right answer, start with God's word. And the Bible gives us the correct view of history, written by people who were there, and ultimately by inspiration of God, who knows everything and never lies. So it makes sense to start with the Bible. And we like to summarize biblical history with the seven C's. Just a nice way to remember biblical history, seven words that start with the letter C. That's kind of a clever idea, I think. We, so we start with creation, where God made a world that he himself called very good. It wasn't just the Garden of Eden. The Bible says God saw everything he had made and behold, it was very good. And of course, what kind of a universe would God create? A very good one, because he's a very good God. 
And it was in fact perfect because he's a perfect God. But God gave Adam a choice to obey or rebel. And Adam chose poorly. And so almost immediately after creation, we have corruption. The world today, not very good. There's a lot of goodness in the world. There's a lot of beauty in the world, but there's a lot of sin. And as a result, ugliness and death and disease and suffering came into the world as a result of Adam's sin because he was in charge of the world. And so it affected everything under his authority. Then we have the catastrophe about 1,600 years after creation, the wickedness of mankind became very great, and God, being a righteous God, he will judge sin. Only a corrupt judge would let sin go unpunished. And so he judged the world with the worldwide flood, which killed all humans and all land animals, except those that were on the ark, because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and that's why we're here today. Uh, so then we have confusion. Again, mankind rebelled against God, and God this time judged them by confusing their languages. And we think that's responsible for the base language groups that we have today. Languages have diversified since then as well. But that also results in the different so-called ethnicities. Some people call them races, but really there's only one race, the human race. But you can get little differences in eye shape and hair color and things like that uh, based on which genes they carry in different parts of the world. That's fine. And then we have Christ. God himself steps into history, something he promised to do back in Genesis. When Adam and Eve rebelled against God, God didn't immediately execute them from, for their sin, although he had the right to do that. He was gracious and provided skins of clothing. I think that represented the, uh, the lamb that would be slain because God killed an animal to provide skins of clothing for Adam and Eve. And that pointed the way to Christ. And God promised that the descendant of Eve, the seed of the woman, would crush the head of the serpent, defeating Satan's power, which Jesus did on the cross where he paid the penalty for our sins, and then he rose again, proving that he is who he claimed to be. He's God incarnate, he's the God man. And being man, he's related to us, he can pay for our sins, and being God, he can pay for an infinite penalty. So that's how that works. And then there's one seed that has yet to happen in its fullness, and that's the consummation, where paradise lost will be paradise restored. And that's something we all look forward to, and it's something we can only enter if we're sinless. That's a problem for us, because we've all sinned, that's why we need a savior. We need our sins paid for and our nature changed so we don't ruin the new world the way we ruined the original. So that is something that we look forward to. And there's a sense in which that's already started because if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. All things are made new. And so that's started, but we haven't seen it in its fullness. And we won't until the return of Christ. So if you're thinking biblically, if you want to put on your biblical reality glasses and we'll see what we can learn about dinosaurs from the perspective of Scripture... One thing we can learn is that dinosaurs are made on day six of the creation week. God made everything in six days. Yes, those are ordinary days, just like our work week that uses the same Hebrew word yom in the same context. Dinosaurs are made on day six. We know that because dinosaurs are land animals by definition. And the Bible says land animals, all animals were made on day six. Everything that creeps on the earth was made on day six. Therefore, dinosaurs are made on day six. So this is just a basic form of logic. This is a syllogism. So there's no doubt that dinosaurs were made on day six, the same day that human beings were made. And so dinosaurs did, in fact, live alongside human beings, according to Scripture. And we'll see there's good evidence in, in the science for that as well. But because they're land animals, we know they're made on day six because the Bible teaches that. So they're not millions of years old. Nothing is, according to Scripture. And they did live alongside people. We don't often see that in children's books, but we should. Uh, Adam and Eve would have known about the dinosaurs and they would have been peaceful creatures originally. That really bugs people because we've seen Jurassic Park and we know how nasty dinosaurs can be. But originally dinosaurs were well behaved, right? Because God saw everything he'd made and it was very good, which means even the dinosaurs were very good originally. There's another way you could know that these dinosaur fossils are not hundreds of millions of years old. That's because they're dead. And death came into the world when Adam sinned. Indeed, that's the penalty for sin. And so there wouldn't have been any death before Adam sinned. And therefore, fossil. anytime you see a fossil, you have to think that's after Adam sinned and ultimately because Adam sinned. That's why death entered the world. And of course, we continue to, to follow in his footsteps, unfortunately. That's why we need a savior. And people get intimidated because they think, well, secular scientists, they can date those fossils, right? I mean, they pick it up and scan it with their tricorder and it measures the age of goals and tell you how old it is, right? Well, no. Fossils don't come with labels telling you how old they are. It'd be nice if they did, but they don't. And I'm happy to talk about things like radiometric dating, which, by the way, they don't use on fossils anyway. They use them on rocks that surround the fossils. But in any case, my point is, if you've ever seen, like in a museum, a label attached 
to the fossil, telling you how old it is. My point is, it didn't come that way. It was attached by someone who was not around when the fossil formed and therefore does not know the age of the fossil. He's making a guess based on certain assumptions. Is there scientific evidence that dinosaurs lived recently and nowhere near millions of years ago? Oh yes. What would you think if we found red blood cells of an organism? You would, you would you think, well, those probably were millions of years old. Well, they're red blood cells. It's not gonna last that long. And yet we found soft tissue from a T-Rex femur. We've actually found several instances of this at this point in time, not just from a T-Rex, but this is one of the first one that was found. You see, a fossil is where a bone has, per usually it's a bone, has permineralized. The minerals have come in and filled in all the holes in the bone, and so you have a stone in the shape of a bone. But we found that when you dissolve away the outer portion of the fossil, a lot of times it's still fresh on the inside. And so you're seeing soft tissue, things like muscle and skin, from a T-Rex femur, a leg bone from a Tyrannosaurus rex, including blood vessels that are still stretchy, by the way. They're still elastic. I've seen videos of them pulling on that and stretching it. And you can even see actual red blood cells there on the right. Those are T-Rex red blood cells. That's cool. I think that's very cool. Now, that's not millions of years old. And I think it's by divine providence. It's, it's a wonderful act of divine providence that it was an evolutionist who made this discovery. And uh, Mary Schweitzer, because if we had discovered it, they'd be like, oh, you come on, that's a hoax. You're making this up. But no, it was an evolutionist who discovered it. And she was honest in her discovery. And I appreciate that. So anyway, did dinosaurs evolve? Well, no, they're made after their kinds. According to scripture, all things are made according to their kinds. That doesn't mean species, by the way, but it does mean that organisms, although they have the ability to diversify, you can get lots of different breeds of dogs from just two, two ancestors, but they remain dogs. And it's the same with the dinosaurs. We have lots of varieties, but there are only so many kinds, and they've always stayed their kinds. They don't evolve into another kind. And the fossil evidence is consistent with that. This is a chart, it's actually from an evolutionist textbook showing dinosaur evolution, what they believe to be dinosaur evolution. So the very bottom there is a thecodont ancestor that's supposed to branch. The branching is the evolution, one kind changing into another. And then the areas that are shaded in blue are the places where we actually find fossils and kind of how far down we find them. And so blue is where you actually find fossils. Where's all the evolution happening? all the places you don't find fossils. That's interesting. The dinosaurs went to great lengths to hide any evidence of their evolution. I mean, that's amazing. So anyway, but uh, what do dinosaurs eat? So there's a, there's a question for us. Let's, let's consider a T-Rex, for example. And let's go back to the beginning. Back the, we'll consider the first T-Rex that God made. What would we be thinking about eating? Maybe some of these guys or... Of course, we now know that humans lived with dinosaurs, so is Adam on the menu? Is that what we're going to have to worry about? Let's consider the first T-Rex. T-Rex, now, T-Rex had teeth up to six inches long. Pretty impressive. How would the first of these animals have been described? Would they have been a plant eater, a meat eater, a scavenger, or a plant and meat eater? Now, how many say plant eater? Okay, how many say meat eater? How many say scavenger? How many say plant and meat eater? Okay, now a lot of you didn't vote. <laughs> you deserve the government you get. Okay, the first T-Rex, and a lot of you got it, the first T-Rex would have been a plant eater. Yeah, and that bothers people, right? Because we've seen Jurassic Park and we know what T-Rex eats. He eats lawyers, right? <laughs> so, but according to scripture, the first T-Rex would have eaten plants, and we know that because the Bible says so. In Genesis 1, God's speaking to Adam and Eve, and God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Verse 30, also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. Would that include dinosaurs? Are they part of everything? Yes. Well, yeah, everything's part of everything. So he says, I've given every green herb for food, and it was so. So those first dinosaurs, regardless of whether they're, they're later classified as meat eaters, originally they were vegetarian, as were Adam and Eve. Now, if you had a hot dog for lunch, that's okay, because after the flood, in Genesis 9-3, God gave permission to human beings to eat meat. Speaking to Noah and his family, he says, as I gave you the plants, I now give you everything that moves on the earth. That's kind of what a hot dog is. So you're okay, <laughs> all right? And, and some of the dinosaurs might have become meat-eating later, but originally they were eating plants. And we know that from scriptures. The dinosaurs, along with all animals, were originally vegetarian. There's another way you could realize that. Because when you're eating meat, hate to break it to you, you're eating a dead animal, yeah. 
And there was no death before Adam sinned. There would have been no meat to eat. So of course they would have been vegetarian. So you could figure that out. Even if the Bible hadn't explicitly told us that, you could figure that out. So that first T-Rex, he's a vegetarian. And that, again, that bothers folks because of the sharp teeth. And indeed, T-Rex had six inch serrated fangs, perfectly designed for ripping and tearing into watermelons and cantaloupes and all kinds of fruits and vegetables. Because if you think about it, I mean, there's some fruits and vegetables. I mean, you think of a watermelon, well, nothing could be softer than that once you get to the inside, right? We use something like a knife, kind of like a sharp tooth, to cut through the exterior to get to the inside, whereas T-Rex could bite right into one and it wouldn't have been a problem for him. Just because an animal has sharp teeth doesn't mean it has to eat meat. It may have that option, but it, it, of course, originally it didn't, but it doesn't mean it has to eat meat. And there are animals today that have sharp teeth that are either primarily or entirely vegetarian. This particular primate, you look at the sharp teeth on that guy, he is primarily vegetarian, only occasionally supplementing his diet with meat. There are these monkeys that live in Ethiopia, and the males have these long fangs on them. And you'd say, well, that's a meat eater. It's not. It's a plant, it's a plant eater. They eat grass. They're the grass-eating uh, monkeys of Ethiopia. Well, why do the males have those long fangs? I don't know, but they eat grass, okay? <laughs> That's just a fact. We know because we've watched them. Uh, you look at this particular skull, and you look at the sharp teeth on that guy, and you say, well, that must be a meat eater, but he's not because this species is still alive today. This is the skull of a fruit bat, and it turns out they eat fruit. Yeah. <laughs> now, obviously, at some point after sin, and it would have to be after sin, some of the animals started eating meat, because the Bible even addresses that issue. The Bible shows you know, animals eating meat at some point. But it's interesting that even today, animals that we think of as meat eaters will sometimes go back to their pre-fall vegetarian diet. For example, lions. We know lions are meat eaters, right? Well, there was a lion, she was named Little Tyke. She was raised in captivity, lived a long, healthy life, never having eaten meat. Never ate meat her whole life. She was a gentle creature. There she is with one of her caretakers. So isn't that wonderful? And it reminds us of the way all animals would have been before sin entered the world. So some of them have gone back to that. Now they try to give little tyke meat because everyone knows lions need meat. Here, come on, take a bite. And you see she's turning away from it. She didn't even like the smell of raw meat. She will drink milk, however. So I mean, she is a mammal. So mammals, we like our milk. So there we go. And you know, the Bible addresses this issue. The Bible actually prophesied of a time when animals, meat eaters, would go back to their pre-fall diet. And it mentions lions specifically in Isaiah 11:7. 7, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. So it seems we're seeing the beginning of that. We're seeing meat eaters start to go back to their vegetarian diet. That's pretty neat. And I love it when scripture does that. When It's something only God can do perfectly is predict the future because he's beyond time. That's something the false gods cannot do. Okay, why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible then? That's a question people ask, and there's a very good reason for it. The word dinosaur is a modern word. It was invented in 1841 by Sir Richard Owen. It means terrible lizard. And, uh, but the Bible, it was translated into English centuries before that. You get the Wycliffe version back in the 1300s. You get the Geneva Bible, 1560. The King James comes along in 1611. The word dinosaur didn't exist in any of those early Bibles. The word dinosaur won't be found in any early Bibles because it didn't exist at that time. But you will find the word dragon in many of those early Bibles. And if you think about what a dragon is, that would, that would be kind of like a dinosaur, wouldn't it? That would be the ancient word that would be used to describe a dinosaur. Putting it another way, if an ancient person saw a dinosaur, what term would they use? Dragon, if they're an English speaker. Now the Hebrew word, because the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, the Hebrew word that is translated dragon in many of these instances is tanim. And here are instances of tanim in the scriptures. So the Bible does address these, these monstrous creatures. Now, tanin is kind of a generic word. It would include dinosaurs, and it would probably include swimming creatures as well. In fact, I'm sure it includes uh, swimming creatures because it's uh, mentioned in uh, Genesis um, 1, 20 or 21, where God created the great sea creatures, great sea, sea monsters in some translations. That's tanin. So yeah, Genesis 121. So what about specific varieties though? I think the Bible mentions some, but they're not gonna be called by their modern names, obviously. When we started finding fossils of dinosaurs, which really began in the 1800s, uh, we'd kind of forgotten about these animals, and so we gave them new names. So the Bible's gonna use the original name for these animals, whatever they are. But there are, there are animals that the Bible describes that match known kinds of dinosaurs. In Job chapter 40, beginning in verse 15, we read about a creature called behemoth. And when you read the description of it, it does sound like one of these long-necked, long-tailed 
dinosaurs like a, a Diplodocus or a Brachiosaurus, what they used to call a Brontosaurus and so on. And, uh, now, and it's always good to get the context of this. Job is classified as wisdom literature. It's written in a poetic fashion, but it's really a history book. It's just that the speeches of Job and his friends were poetic in nature, and so Job accurately records that. And uh, you, we talk about the patience of Job, and you remember the account, I'm sure, if you've read this. If not, you, you should read it. It's a good account. Uh, we talk about the patience of Job. Toward the end, he was getting a little bit impatient. He, was, he, he had a lot of problems that he had to deal with, and he wanted to have a conversation with God and plead his case. He really did. And God graciously condescended and answered Job, beginning in chapter 38. And basically, God's response was, okay, Job, let's have a conversation, but before we do that, let's see if you're qualified. And God began asking Job a series of questions that Job could not answer. And he got the point. He said, I can't contend with the Almighty. I can't argue with God. He got it. And of course, God rewarded him for his patience and his understanding. But in any case, uh, God began then in, in chapter 38, he began discussing various aspects of his creation that Job can't understand or deal with, including a number of animals that God created. And so my point is, when we get up to verse 15 in chapter 40, God is actually building up larger and more impressive animals until we get to behemoth. And that's kind of it, because that's, this is an amazing creature. But my point is, it would have to be a real animal that Job was familiar with, otherwise God's argument makes no sense. Right? God can't say, hey, look at this, this imaginary creature. That doesn't, you can't look at an imaginary creature, right? Um, look at my, my powers like this. Are you saying your power is fictional? No, it's a real creature that Job was familiar with. So let's see if it fits the description of a long-necked, long-tailed uh, quadruped dinosaur. So verse 15, look now at behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. So I made along with you, that may refer to the fact they're both made on day six, man and, and land, all land animals. He eats grass like an ox, so it's still an herbivore. This, Job, we think, was written around 2000 BC, so around 2000 years after creation. So it's still an herbivore at this point. And we think these dinosaurs remained herbivores. We don't think they ever became meat-eating. Uh, verse 16, see now his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. And that would be a great description of one of these sauropodomorph dinosaurs that had the long neck and the long tail. They had powerful muscles along their stomach that they needed to support their long neck and their long tail. Verse 17 says he moves his tail like a cedar. Now, it's a tree, of course. So when he's moving his tail, he's like moving a cedar tree. That's impressive. And indeed, it would be like a tree trunk. Just, wow, that'd be something to see. Uh, verse 18, his bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. Verse 19, he's the first of the ways of God perhaps indicating that he's sort of the largest land animal that God made. And we do think that these dinosaurs were the largest land animal that God made. The largest animal that God made is still around. It's the blue whale. So I was uh, giving this talk to some kids earlier this morning, real young kids, and I, and I asked them that. I said, what's the largest animal that's still alive? They said, blue whale, they got it. I was pretty impressed. Uh, Only he who made him can bring near a sword. That sounds awkward in English, but it's basically saying only God could attack this animal. If you come at it with the sword, it's going to bat you away with its tail, and that's the end of you. Okay. Now, some Bibles in the footnotes, they'll have a footnote next to behemoth. Because you see, that's the original Hebrew word. They left it untranslated, behemoth. And some will have in the footnotes, behemoth, possibly an elephant or hippopotamus. Now, does the description fit an elephant or hippopotamus? Does an elephant have a tail like a cedar tree? It does not. Does a hippopotamus have a tail like a cedar tree? Nothing could be further from it, okay? And when I do this for the youngsters, I say, you could imagine an elephant or a hippo with a tail like a cedar tree. That's not going to work, right? They, get the, they got the point. They, got the, they laughed too. So, no, I, I don't know for sure that it's a dinosaur, but I do know it's not an elephant or hippo because the description does not fit. It does fit that of a sauropod, sauropodomorph dinosaur. Now, in the next chapter in Job, we read about a swimming creature. So this would not be a true dinosaur, probably, because uh, it lives in the water. But uh, it does seem to fit the description of something like a plesiosaur, which evolutionists believe died out you know, 65 million years ago, along with the dinosaurs, um, in their view. But when you read the description, it's impressive creature, whatever it is. It's magnificent. Verse 1, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? That's a rhetorical question. Of course not. As you're supposed to think, of course not. Indeed, any hope of overcoming him is false. Shall one not be overwhelmed at the sight of him? Whatever this is, it's big, and Job knew it. So it's a massive creature. Verse 10, no one is so fierce that would dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand against me? 
You see the argument God's making? Job, you can't even deal with my creature. You're terrified of it. I'm its creator, right? Verse 15, his rows of scales are his pride. Shut up tightly as with a seal. So it's a scaly creature. It is a reptile. One is so near another that no air can come between him. Verse 22, strength dwells in his neck. That's an interesting uh, aspect of the creature to, to, uh, uh, to, to talk about. Strength dwells in his neck. That made me think of one of these long-necked plesiosaurs. Some plesiosaurs had short necks. Some had long necks, depending on the species. Elasmosaur, for example, had a really long neck. So it made me think of one of the long-necked uh, plesiosaurs. Verse 25, when he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. So this thing can apparently raise himself up. Maybe come, you know, come near the shore, raise himself up, and people were terrified of it. You'll see on ancient maps, well, you see a lot of times in the ocean out there, you'll see dragons, right? They were worried about him. Uh, because of his crashings, they're beside themselves. On earth, there is nothing like him which is made without fear. Now, some Bibles, again, in the footnotes, will say you know, th that the Leviathan is possibly a crocodile. That's, and, and the thing you need to remember about your footnotes, they're not inspired. It's the text that's inspired. The footnotes may be helpful, but they're not always right. It's the text that's always right. Um, in any case, could this be a crocodile? Well, can a crocodile raise himself up? Not really, because he's got that sprawling gait. He can't more, get more than a foot off the ground. And I wouldn't call it, I, I wouldn't um, talk about how magnificent the crocodile's neck is either, because they don't have much of one, yes. right? I mean, they do technically, but you don't really see it. Whereas one of these long-necked uh, plesiosaurs, that would fit the description. So it's not a, it's not a crocodile. That's not going to work. And I didn't read all the verses. You might read them later on your own. But some of them talk about sparks leaping out of its mouth and smoke going out of its nostrils. And that's where the critics really say, oh, come on, not only is it a dragon, it's a fire-breathing dragon, you can't have that. And then my, always, my question is always, why not? <laughs> Scientifically, can you tell me why that would be impossible? Because God has made some amazing animals that have abilities that are uh, extraordinary. In fact, there's an insect that does nearly that. It's called a bombardier beetle. It mixes a couple of chemicals along with a catalyst in its abdomen. It's able to produce this hot spray to protect it from predators. There's no reason why God couldn't do that with a larger animal. If God can do that in an insect, he could do it with a reptile. That's not a problem. Lots of th amazing creatures that God made. And you know, if we just found the bones of some of them, like an electric eel, if we just found the bones of an electric eel, you'd never know that it could, that it could shock people. I mean, that's, that's amazing. So we gotta be careful about saying, oh, it can't do that when you don't have any evidence that it can't do that. So I think the Bible does describe true dinosaurs. I think it describes these swimming creatures, these marine reptiles. What about flying reptiles? The Bible does talk about them, very specifically. In uh, Isaiah 14, 29, it describes a fiery flying serpent. Serpent would be the ancient word for reptile, right? And it's a, it's a flying serpent. And again, in Isaiah chapter 30, verse six, a fiery flying serpent. Isn't that interesting? And it's a special word for it too, seraph is the word for it. It's related to seraphim, which is a class of angel. So, but apparently seraph referred to these, um, these actual physical creatures. And, and, and that term is also used in some places when the Israelites were being plagued with uh, serpents. Isn't that interesting? So it might have not just been terrestrial snakes that they were dealing with. It might have been flying reptiles. I, I, I always had trouble understanding why, why couldn't they get away from snakes? Because most, most snakes don't move that fast. Some of them can move kind of fast, but... If they were flying reptiles, that would be real hard to get away from. In any case, there's two clear instances of flying serpents in Scripture, flying reptiles. So the Bible does address dinosaurs, just not with their modern names, but it does address creatures that would be described as dragons in the older English. So were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark then, and would they fit? Well, first of all, would they have been on Noah's Ark? What does the Bible say? Genesis 7 eight through nine of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground. There it is. There went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. So every air-breathing land animal, as far as we know, went on the ark, according to scripture. Now, that doesn't mean every animal went on the ark. Everything that creeps on the ground went on the ark. So fish don't have to go on the ark, right? Uh, the, uh, Noah didn't need an aquarium. He's in an aquarium, right? <laughs> Whales don't have to, whales are mammals. They don't have to go on the ark. They can survive off the ark. I've had critics that have mocked the Bible. How are you going to get the whales on the ark? Come on. Come on. But critics will make fun. They'll mock and say, well, you can't get dinosaurs on Noah's ark because dinosaurs are huge, right? There's no way. Because, I mean, they fill a room in a museum. Well, dinosaurs, some dinosaurs were huge, but the ark was huger. It was, right? 
You see, when a critic comes up and asks you, or, or says to you, there's no way you could possibly get all those animals, including the dinosaurs on Noah's Ark, you need to ask him two questions. Do you know how big Noah's Ark was? And do you know how many animals would have to go on board and how much space they'd take up? And the funny thing is most critics don't know the answer to either question. Do you know how big Noah's Ark was? Well, no. Do you know how many animals would have to go on board? Well, well no, but I just don't think you could get them all on there. I don't think they would fit. That's not a logical objection. The idea that you can't possibly fit an unknown number of animals on a boat of unknown size. That's not rational. And it really exposes the psychological, the psychology of secular humanism. It's not a rational religion. It's emotion-based. Well, we know how big Noah's Ark was. We don't have to ask about that. The Bible gives the dimensions. No, it gives it in cubits. It's, um, it's uh, 300 cubits by 50 by 30. A cubit's about a foot and a half. It's, it's the distance from your elbow to the tip of your hand. But of course, that's a little different for different people, isn't it? And so there's some leeway on the cubit, and we're not sure which cubit Noah used, but at the smallest would have been the dimensions you see there. More realistically, it'd been 450 feet long by 75 feet wide by 45 feet tall. It was enormous. But unfortunately, a lot of people have misconceptions about the ark, and I'm sorry to say that we Christians sometimes promote those misconceptions in our children's literature where you'll see Noah's Ark, like this little bathtub ark, right? All the animals jam-packed on board and they're happy and smiling even though the world's being destroyed. But um, in any case, that's not the real ark, right? That's not the real ark. The real ark had the same capacity as 522 railroad stock cars. Have you seen the train crossing the tracks and counted, ever counted the cars? And you know, kids like to do that. I've never counted 522. That's a lot of, that's a lot of volume. You could imagine Noah's shock and disappointment if God told him to build a little bathtub ark. He'd be like, are you sure? But no, God told him the right dimensions, at least the dimensions, perhaps other information that's not recorded, we don't really know. But he at least told him the dimensions. And God does know how to build a boat. Yep. <laughs> he built the universe. He knows that you can build a boat, right? And little bathtub arks, they would not survive a worldwide flood. The ark that Noah built, designed by God, it did survive, and we're, we're proof that it did. We've had engineers that have studied the design of the ark, the dimensions and such. Tim Lovett did some wonderful studies on this uh, some years back and found that the ark is optimized to weather a worldwide flood. You change the dimensions, you change the aspect ratio, it's less well designed. It's either less stable, more likely to capsize, or less comfortable in terms of the way that it rides. Not surprising, not surprising. What is kind of surprising to a secularist is that Noah was able to figure that out with, with the, without the supercomputers that we have today to do these kind of studies. It's almost as if he had some kind of divine insight into the issue. So Noah's Ark was huge, but was it big enough? How many animals would have to go on board? Now we know the Bible says two of each kind, seven of some, but there were relatively few of the clean kinds, mostly two of each kind. And this is where people get confused because what's a kind? A kind is not the same as a species. It's not the same as a breed even. And so my point is Noah did not have to take two Dalmatians, two deer hounds, two beagles, two border collies, two golden retrievers on board, his, on board the ark. He just had to take two dogs and get all those breeds later. And we've, stu we've studied how this works genetically. God has built into animals the ability to diversify. Sometimes you can even get what are classified as new species if they, can't, if they don't regularly interbreed with another group from the same kind. That's not evolution. That's diversification within a kind. They still remain the same kind of animal, always. Always have been, always will be. So my point is you only need two dogs on Noah's Ark. You only need two cats on Noah's Ark. That big lion that you see in the zoo and that little pathetic thing you come home and pet, <laughs> they're related. They're descended from two cats that were on Noah's Ark. We've done in interbreeding studies that have revealed that. And so I think that's kind of amazing. So God has built into cats the ability to diversify into different sizes and so on. So all cats are related. But, but only to cats, they're not related to dogs, okay? It's the same with the dinosaurs, and that's what I wanted to point out. Because there's, you know, there's thousands of dinosaur names, right? And if you have young kids, they can probably recite them all, right? But there's, we think there's only about 60 dinosaur kinds. So all, like these ceratopsians, that's a kind. These are just, think of these as different breeds, like you get the different breeds of dog. And so Noah didn't need to take two triceratops and two Taurosaurus and two Monoclonius and two Pachyrhinosaurus. You just need two Ceratopsians. You can get all those breeds later. They're classified as different species. That's okay. They're the same kind. So we, th we think there's only about 60 dinosaur kinds. 60 dinosaur kinds. And one male and one female from each, that would make 120 dinosaurs that would have been on Noah's Ark. 
So that's the real number. And creation scientists have done studies like this. John Woodmerappy did a wonderful uh, research project where he estimated the number of animals that would have gone on board Noah's Ark. Number of mammals, a lot of mammals, but not all mammals. Whales don't have to go on board Noah's Ark, they're mammals. Uh, birds, reptiles, including, so 120 of those would be dinosaurs for a grand total of about 16,000, less than 16,000 animals would have been on Noah's Ark. And he's being what we call generous to the critics. That's probably an upper limit. It's probably a little less than that. But in any case, uh, about 16,000 animals on board Noah's Ark. He said, well, yeah, and 120 of them are dinosaurs, but dinosaurs are huge, right? So, I mean, even 120 of them, that's a, that's a lot of space. You need to remember, some dinosaurs are huge. Some dinosaurs never got bigger than a dog. Some never got bigger than a chicken. Little Comsognathus, that's all the bigger they got. Why are they dinosaurs? They're a reptile and their legs are underneath their body. That makes them a dinosaur. Uh, I mean, yeah, not all dinosaurs are big. The other thing you need to remember is that even these huge dinosaurs that fill a room in a museum from head to tail, the big, uh, you know, long-necked dinosaurs, they started out very small because the largest dinosaur eggs we find are a little bigger than a football. That big, long-necked dinosaur, when he hatched, he had to fit in an egg like that. So he wasn't very big when he, was first, when he first hatched. So that's the thing we need to remember, too. When it makes sense for God to select some of the younger dinosaurs, where maybe they hadn't reached their full size, to go on board the ark. Maybe not babies, because he wants them to go and multiply quickly after the flood, but maybe young adults, where they hadn't reached their full size yet. Uh, some reptiles grow rapidly to adulthood, and then they continue to grow the rest of their life at a slower rate. Not all reptiles do that, but some do. We don't know if dinosaurs did that, but it could be that the very big ones were also the very old ones. Why would God select senior citizen dinosaurs when he can take young adults, right? I mean, that would make more sense, since it was only to go and multiply afterwards, so that would make sense. Noah didn't have to go out and find them. God brought the animals to Noah. Two of each will come to you, the text says. So it may have been the first migration for all we know, but in any case. So we can compute the amount of space available, that's no problem. 450 feet by 75 by three decks, 100,000 square feet, Ark was big. And it may have even had mezzanine levels which would increase the, the usable space even more. The Bible doesn't record that, but it doesn't say it didn't have them either. And so we can estimate the amount of space taken up by the animals, these are again are Wood Merapi's numbers. Yeah, birds take up very little space because most of them are small. Mammals take up the most space because there's the most of them. And then reptiles, including the dinosaurs, take up 16% of the space on the ark for a grand total of 46.8%. So could all the animals fit on the ark? Yeah. Yes. Yes, when you do the math, you can see that. And, and by the way, I, I, want, I have to mention this too because I mean, there's, there's a few, we have a few youngsters here because sometimes young students in their math class, when am I ever gonna use this stuff? There you go, right? I can refute the critics because I can do math. And frankly, it's not hard math, okay? We're talking about multiplication and addition here. It's not like it needs calculus or anything like that. Anyway, if you do your homework, uh, the Bible always, always wins. There's no doubt about that. It's God's word. So there's plenty of space. And the dinosaurs would have been on the ark, which means they would have got off the ark and reproduced. The environment was different after the flood. We think dinosaurs probably never reached the same numbers that they had before the flood. But, but they, they were there. And that being the case, would we expect to find legends of people encountering dinosaurs? Well, yeah. Of course, they wouldn't be called dinosaurs. They'd be called dragons. Do we find legends of people encountering dragons? Oh, yes. All over the world. All over the world. And you read the descriptions of them, and they, a lot of them match known kinds of dinosaurs. And again, the, the, these are not in scripture like the other examples we saw. These are outside of scripture, and so they're not infallible. They could have been passed down by word of mouth before they were written down and maybe exaggerated a little bit. Maybe different, combined, different uh, reptiles were combined into our modern conception of a dragon that kind of combines the different dinosaurs. But in any case, there are lots of legends of dragons in history. There's the legend of St. George and the dragon. There was a town that was being victimized by a dragon that was coming in and eating all of their livestock. And the legend says that the, the people of the town were gonna sacrifice a young lady to this monster, hoping that it would leave them alone. Not a smart thing to do. But in any case, St. George rides in on his horse, slays the dragon, preaches Christianity, many people convert. Now, again, it's not in the Bible, but we have found fossils in the area where this was to have taken place, including fossils of Allosaurus, I believe, which is kind of a smaller version of a T-Rex. So that's pretty interesting. 
Marco Polo in AD 1271 reported that the Chinese royal chariots were occasionally pulled by dragons. That's interesting to think that some of them were used to perform labor even. That's kind of fascinating, I think. Lots of legends of dragons in China. Oh, it's all over China. There may have been more dinosaurs in that area, and so they have more of these. So, but um, it, apparently, if you were wealthy, the thing to do was to ra raise your own dragons because they were very rare at this time in history. But in the year 1611, the Chinese emperor appointed the position of royal dragon feeder. There was a job where your job was to feed the dragons, which makes me think they probably had some. So that's pretty neat. There's a city in France that was renamed in the honor of the killing of a dragon there. The animal's described as being larger than an ox, armored, and had horns on its head. It sounds an awful lot like a triceratops or one of these ceratopsian dinosaurs. There's an account from Italy. This one's very detailed. There was an Italian peasant who was walking uh, in the evening behind his oxen. His oxen were pulling a cart, and he's kind of walking behind them. And they stopped because there's this little hissing dragon on the road up ahead of them. This is not one of the bigger ones. It's one of the smaller ones. But it's very brave, very odd-looking, Long neck, long tail, but kind of but small. And it's hissing at them, and the oxen are afraid of it. They won't go near this thing. And so the, this man had a, a staff with him that he ended, up, he ended up striking the creature and killing it. And then he did something very smart. He brought the body in to a local scientist named Ulysses Aldervandus. Aldervandus carefully studied the carcass and reported it was unquestionably a reptile, but one unlike any others he had ever seen. And he documented it so specifically. We think we know what species it is. We think it was a Tanistrophius. Something that evolutionists say, well, that went extinct 65 million year, years ago, except apparently people saw them. So that's a problem for secularism. Anyway, so the moral of the story is, if you ever kill a dinosaur, bring the body into a scientist so we can document it, okay? I'd love to see that happen. What about flying reptiles? Lots of legends of those too. Some, I would say, are just good historical documentation. Herodotus was a Greek historian who confirmed some of the events of the Bible. He'd heard about these flying reptiles. He went to look for them. He says, when I arrived there, I saw innumerable bones and backbones of serpents, many heaps of backbones, great and small and even smaller. He found a valley full of dead flying reptiles. Pretty neat. And from the description, we think it's a Ramphorhynchus. Uh, there were different kinds of flying reptiles. There were the pterodactyls. They had huge wingspans, but a very small tail. And then there was the Ramphorhynchus. The Ramphorhynchus, they were small, but they had a long tail. And, but they're reptiles. They're just flying reptiles. And so we think it's a Ramphorhynchus. He said, uh, winged serpents are said to fly from Arabia at the beginning of spring, making for Egypt, but the ibis birds encounter the invaders in this pass and kill them. And he even documents that the Egyptians worshipped the ibis birds, inappropriately, of course, for doing them the favor of killing these nasty flying reptiles, because according to these reports, they were poisonous. They'd bite you and you'd get sick. And so that was a bit of a problem. So the Egyptians were grateful to the ibis birds for killing these nasty ramphrancus. He says, the serpents are like water snakes. Their wings are not feathered, but very like the wings of a bat. And so he's going out of his way to say, this isn't a bird. It's not covered with feathers. It's a scaly creature. It's a reptile, but it's a flying one, a winged one. And its wings are like a membrane material, like a bat's wing. Uh, the eyewitness reports of this go back to 400 BC and all the way up to 1600. And then they stop. And so this thing is extinct now, as far as we know. There have been people who have claimed to see flying reptiles in other remote parts of the world, but in this area, uh, in and near Egypt, um, they've been extinct for 400 years, but not millions of years. That's kind of neat. Uh, you will occasionally find serpents with wings on ancient coins as well. So people did see flying serpents, there's no doubt about it. People in the past sometimes lived in caves. That's one of the funnier questions I get is, do you believe in cavemen? Do I believe men lived in caves? Yeah. Abraham's nephew, Lot, he lived in a cave for a while, according to Genesis, right? It's a good place to be. You don't have to build your house. You just move in. It's right there for you. And people that lived in caves would sometimes paint on the cave walls. I always thought it was the kids that did it. but I, I don't, we, don't, we don't really know. But in any case, it could be. And they would draw things like people and buffalo. And occasionally, they'd draw things that look an awful lot like dinosaurs. Now again, these would date back to before dinosaur fossils were found. Dinosaur fossils have been, were found in the 1800s, really. That's the first time they were found in any abundance. So apparently people saw the actual animals. It's pretty neat. Let me show you a couple of these. Here's a petroglyph of what appears to be a sauropod dinosaur. Pretty neat. Now we've outlined it for you on the right, otherwise on PowerPoint it doesn't show up really good. But once you see it on the right, you can see it on the left. Uh, there's another petroglyph. This is from Natural Bridges National Monument in Utah. 
And again, it looks like a four-legged, long-necked, long-tailed dinosaur. We just don't have animals that look like that today. I mean, we got long-necked ones like a giraffe, but they don't have the long, massive tail. So, or um, these, these creatures, which are carved in certain places in France. Uh, Vance Nelson did a wonderful study on this. He went to different parts of the world and looked for sculptures and drawings and, and, uh, and the like of dinosaur-like animals. And you see it's got scales on it. It's a reptile, and some of them are even uh, fire-breathing. So, yeah. So people apparently saw these things. You wouldn't know that something was fire-breathing from the bones, right? And they do match known kinds of dinosaurs. They really do. There's some ancient tapestries that have depictions of various animals on them. And uh, one of the depictions, we zoom in on it, looks like a juvenile dinosaur, perhaps a, a myosaurus. It does match. There's some sculptures from China. This is thought to be 4,000 years old. This is thought to date back to the time of Abraham and Job. But it's from China. And it's just amazing. It really looks like a Ceratopsian dinosaur, either a Monoclonius or a Centrosaurus, one of the ones that had the frill and, in this case, a single horn. Some of them had, you know, Triceratops had three horns, some of them had one horn, and so on. Uh, or or uh, uh, Protoceratops, they had no horns, they just had the frill. And so that's what it looks like. And again, it's from China. Again, a thought to be about 4,000 years old. Bishop Bell's tomb in Carlisle Cathedral. Now, we know when the guy died, and we know he, was di he died, he was buried, and this tomb was erected in 1496, okay? And you'll see that there are these brass strips along the side of the tomb, along, along the sides and the top. And there was one on the bottom, but it's worn off now with time, unfortunately. There's a carpet that goes over this. People walk on the carpet, and that bottom strip is worn off. But the other strips have carvings of animals in them. Animals you'd recognize, like bats, dogs, fish, birds, and these guys. Isn't that neat? Zoom in on one of them here. Long neck, long tail. Pretty neat. Looks an awful lot like the long necked dinosaurs. There's a temple in Cambodia. Uh, if memory serves, this goes back to about 800 AD. And there are carvings of people and animals, including this animal, which is interesting because it's got what looks like plates along the back. It seems to match like a stegosaurus. It's a little bit stylized, but that's what it looks like to me. The Australian Aborigines have a painting of a creature they believe still lives in Lake Galilee in northern Queensland of Australia. They call it Yaru. This is their painting of it. It's remarkable. I mean, that's what a plesiosaur looks like with the four flippers. One of them is covered by the body of the animal. Apparently, this one had died. They've opened up the digestive tract. But otherwise, they're terrified of this creature. And some of them think it's still, it's still alive today, which is kind of interesting. So that's Yaru. Uh, the, the African natives, the natives of the African Congo, have a creature. They call it Mokele Mbembe. That's their name for it. And it, you, if you ask them to describe it, they describe a sauropod dinosaur. The long neck, the long tail. They claim it kills elephants. And if you show them a picture of that dinosaur, they'll say Mokele Mbembe. If you show them a picture of a bear, they'll go, you don't know, because they don't have bears there. So they're not, they're not making it up, is my point. And, uh, and the eyewitness reports are as recent as 1990. Isn't that interesting? And after that, there aren't any more. So this thing might be extinct now. But, and, and granted, we don't have pictures of it, so I'm, this isn't proof positive. It's just an interesting possibility. And it is a possibility in the creation worldview. But yeah, I gotta tell you, the idea that there might have been dinosaurs around 30 years ago, that my life may have overlapped with a dinosaur, makes me feel kind of old. It really does. <laughs> But there are things that are just as amazing from a secular perspective, like the fact that we find Wallamai Pines in Australia. Wait, what's so spectacular about that? Wallamai Pines are found in the same fossil layers as dinosaurs, and not above. And so secularists had assumed that these trees had been extinct for at least 65 million years, maybe more. I, don't, I forget where they exactly are supposed to die off. But um, it's interesting. Uh, well, Jurassic rock layers, so that's even lower. So, previously assumed to have been extinct for millions of years, they've now been found in three different locations in Australia. And the first one was found in 1994. They're still there, they're still reproducing, they're still around. Isn't that wild? And I find that fascinating because it's not like a tree can run away and hide, and yet it evaded our detection until 1994. Sometimes people don't know what it is they're looking at, you know? And, it, and these are remote locations, so don't get me wrong. It makes you wonder if there might be some dinosaurs that are still out there, maybe. That'd be kind of cool. Doesn't guarantee it. But most of the dinosaurs, and perhaps all of them, have died. And so that brings the question then, 
what happened to them. And it's not just the dinosaurs. Lots of things have died. Lots of things have gone extinct since creation. There are plants that aren't around anymore. There are other animals, mammoths, we don't have those anymore. Although elephants, we think, are the same kind as mammoths, so there's still a variety of that around. Uh, trilobites, these, these guys that lived in the ocean, they're similar to a pill bug. You know those pill bugs, you touch them, they roll up into a little ball. Trilobites could do that too, except trilobites lived in the ocean, but they could roll in on themselves. And uh, they, used to, they used to be all over the Earth's oceans. And today, as far as we know, there's not a single trilobite alive on Earth anywhere. They're extinct. Lots of things have gone extinct uh, since creation. And there are lots of specific reasons why that happens. A disease can come through and wipe them out. And you know, their competitors are immune to it for whatever reason. Or famine comes through and wipes them out. They're not able to get to a new area. They're not able to get food. Or they're, they're not able to digest the food that their competitor can, and so they die and their competitor lives. Or they're hunted to extinction. There's a possibility we don't often think about, but you read all these legends of people going out and slaying dragons. Maybe we drove some of them to extinction. That's certainly a possibility. But ultimately, the reason things die is because of sin. I mean, ultimately, the reason we don't have dinosaurs and we just have their fossils is because Adam rebelled against God, and that brought sin and death into the world. And it affected the animals because Adam was in charge of the animals. God gave Adam dominion over all the creatures of the earth, and so when Adam sinned, it affected them as well. They would start dying at that point as well. And we understand this. I mean, it doesn't seem fair on the one hand, but on the other hand, we experience it, right? When you're under someone's authority and they do something wicked, you suffer, right? When our government does something stupid, we all suffer as a result of it. That's just the nature of authority, whether you like it or not. And so these fossils remind us that God judges sin. And by the way, we think the vast majority of these dinosaur fossils, maybe all of them, but it's certainly the majority, were produced during that worldwide flood. That's ideal. Flood conditions are what you want for forming fossils because they kill an organism, they do it quickly, they bury them in sediment, and that's what you need to protect the organism from decaying and being recycled back into the environment for it to fossilize. And if the right chemicals move through calcite crystals, they'll, they'll cause the minerals to lock together and so on. So you get a stone in the shape of a bone. So we think most of these fossils are from that flood, maybe a few afterwards, but mostly from that flood. And so you see these hills, you know, you can see hillsides where they've cut through and you see fossils in them everywhere. Um, we've got one in, um, in Denver, Dinosaur Ridge, where there are still dinosaur bones in the side of the mountain that they've cut through. And you can go up and put your hand on a on a fossilized dinosaur bone that's still in the mountain. On the other side, there's dinosaur tracks. It's really fun to see. But those would have been flood, flood fossils, flood remains. And so it reminds us that God judges sin, and that's why we need a savior, and that reminds us of the gospel, that God's paid the penalty for our sin, so we don't have to go extinct. Now, we are gonna die, but God's promised to resurrect us, and we know he can do it, because he did it to himself. He's proved, he's proved that, Jesus proved that he is God. And so you can use dinosaurs as a segue to the gospel to show people the true nature of how death came into the world, that it's the penalty for sin, and that they need a savior. And I can't think of a better use for dinosaurs than as missionary reptiles. I think that's a great use for them, don't you? Yeah. We can summarize dinosaur history in the five Fs. We talked about the seven Cs, there's five Fs. Okay, dinosaurs were formed on day six. They were very good, along with everything else that God made, because God saw everything he'd made, and behold, it was very good, that would include the dinosaurs. Originally vegetarian, there was no meat to eat because there was no death, so of course they'd be vegetarian. They're fallen. When Adam fell into sin, that affected the rest of the world. God cursed the animals, he cursed the serpent above the other animals, indicating they're cursed too, right? He cursed the, the earth to produce thorns and thistles, something that it hadn't produced previously. Maybe the same plants, but God may have activated the gene that caused them to produce thorns at that point. And maybe some of the dinosaurs became mediating at that point, or perhaps later. Then there was the, the great flood, which wiped out pretty much everything on the earth. In fact, everything on the earth except that was on those that were on uh, Noah's Ark. But there were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark, and yes, they'd fit, we've done the math. So they would have got off the Ark, and then they faded for whatever reason. Maybe the environment was not as good for supporting um, dinosaur-like life after the flood. In any case, they faded from history till they're passed down by word of mouth, and eventually written down in some of these legends. Maybe they were exaggerated a little bit before they were written down, we don't really know. Uh, but that's where we get our modern conception of a dragon. And then finally, dinosaurs were found. They were rediscovered in the 1800s. We started finding the fossils of these creatures that used to be alive and share this planet with us. We need to recognize that the secular world uses dinosaurs, but they do it inappropriately. They'll take, they'll take 
they'll take dinosaurs and then they'll tell a fictional story about it and they hope to get you to buy the fictional story because the fossils are real. And, and a lot of people fall for that. And they start young. They start very young. They want to win children over too. And I've seen um, programs that are clearly designed for little children, your dinosaur train and things like that, where they talk about evolution in these, in these programs. It's, it's appalling. We need to recognize that Christians are not the only fishers of men. In the same way the secular world can use fiction to try and win people over to an evolutionary view, we can use the truth about dinosaurs, their recorded history that we have in the Bible and the scientific evidence that we have around us to show people that the Bible really is true from the very beginning. It makes sense of dinosaurs. It makes sense of every topic on which it touches, and it is true. It's the true history of the universe. And that's what we're really all about at the Biblical Science Institute. We want to reconnect the Bible to the real world because the secularists have done a good job trying to persuade many people that the Bible is just a collection of interesting stories, perhaps with moral value. But it's not. I mean, yeah, there's moral value and there's good stories in the Bible, but they're true. They happened. And they make sense of the world around us. And so let me show you some of the resources that we have out back. We do have this presentation, Dinosaurs in the Bible. We have that on DVD. If you want to get that for your friend who wasn't here and should have been here, you can bring that to them. Uh, one book that I highly recommend that, that uh, people read is The Ultimate Proof of Creation. It's going to give you a bulletproof argument for biblical creation that no one has ever been able to refute. And I dare say they can't. It's really teaching you to think and debate the way that Jesus did in his earthly ministry. And Jesus was not the kind of person you wanted to debate against. So you can learn to do that too. Understanding Genesis. How do we know the days really are days that God really created in six days and so on. That's going to go through that and show you how, how we know those things. And how to, um, and, and I refute some folks who disagree and show how their arguments don't stand up to scrutiny. Taking back astronomy, refuting the Big Bang and the billions of years and showing that astronomy really declares God's glory, as the Bible says in Psalm 19.1. Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, how to better enjoy the night sky from a Christian perspective. And so that's a fun resource if you want to know when the next meteor shower is and things like that. So that's a fun resource for that. Astronomy Reveals Creation, a DVD on just what the name implies showing you that the universe declares God's glory. Worlds of Creation takes you on a tour of the solar system. We've now sent spacecraft to all the planets in our solar system, and even a lot of the moons. And we have these detailed images, they're beautiful, and they declare God's glory. And there's evidence that they're not billions of years old. It lines up with biblical creation. It's fascinating stuff. Secret Code of Creation shows that God has built beauty into an aspect of creation that most people never even think about. And there is no secular alternative to what you're going to see there. It just only makes sense in a Christian worldview. It's beautiful, too. It's artwork of God. And we have that on Blu-ray as well because it's very pretty. And we now have a book that goes along with that, Fractals, The Secret Code of Creation. And we now have that in hardcover, too, which wasn't available the last time I was here. If you want, and we only do these for when, we're, when we show up in person, we, we have these packs. We don't offer the packs on the website, so that's just for tonight. Uh, we have the book pack, the best of our books together for 20% discount. We have our DVD pack, the best of our videos together for 20% discount. And we have our library pack, kind of the best of everything for a 30% discount. So if you wanted to have an immediate creation library at your disposal, that's the way to do it. We have children's resources as well. Now, I didn't write these, but I highly endorse them. They're very well done. They're done by our, our sister ministry, Answers in Genesis. And Answers for Teens, Answers for Kids, very well done. Uh, one Blood for Kids, because racism is becoming an issue, again, as the left uh, moves toward their agenda. But there's really only one race, the human race, and that shows you how all that works, and uh, biblically and scientifically. We have a lot of stuff on dinosaurs. Kids like dinosaurs. If you want to get them interested in Scripture, hey, what does the Bible have to say about dinosaurs? Quite a bit. So we have a number of resources on that as well. Uh, we do have a free monthly newsletter. It's, a, it's an electronic newsletter, so make sure you put your email address or you will get nothing, okay? Uh, make sure you write it legibly or you will get nothing because uh, I or someone has to input those. And in any case, uh, we just, that just kind of keeps you informed on what we're doing at the Biblical Science Institute. It usually comes out mid-month and uh, just kind of let you know what we're doing. We just want to bless you, so there's no catch. Not too many things free in this world, just salvation in our newsletter. So do sign up for that. How, how many of you are already signed up for the newsletter, by the way? Wow, like three, four, okay. Now, I've been here before, so the rest of you need to repent of that sin. <laughs> sign up for the newsletter. <laughs> and do check us out on the web as well, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. I want to thank you very much. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for the amazing things that you've made on this planet, and we thank you for all the science that we have today that just shows that you are the creator in a way that uh, 
I mean, people have never had an excuse, but how much more today, to, the, the, all this stuff that we have. And we thank you for the access to that, and we thank you for the freedom to be able to talk about these things and to share the gospel with folks. I pray this message is encouraging and, and bolsters people's confidence in your word and that it's used in some gospel conversations. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.